Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar with Apps Anywhere's CEO and co-founder, Nick Johnson. Today, we'll be presenting our findings, showcasing insights and sharing perspective on what the future holds for higher ed IT. We're just going to give it a brief minute to give everyone a chance to join before we start. So if you'd like to grab a drink and get comfy, please feel free. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar with Nick Johnson, Apps Anywhere's CEO and co-founder. Today's webinar is all about what the future holds for higher ed IT, where we'll be presenting our findings, showcasing insights, and sharing perspectives from across the globe. If you have a question during today's webinar, please feel free to use the chat and we will answer all questions either in this webinar or over on our website afterwards, appsanywhere.com. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um... Good afternoon, good good morning, uh, where, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I know I recognise uh, a few names of, of people on here, but for those that I've not met, I'm Nick Johnson, CEO here at Apps Anywhere. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, historically, we've been quite reserved in giving our opinion and, and sharing thoughts. Um, perhaps it's an English thing, but in, in the last few months, um, some folk has pushed us to start talking a little bit more about our experiences and, and what we see going on in the world. Um, I personally visited somewhere between 400 and 500 universities face to face across more than 25 countries. Um, I, I have lost count now. Um, there are only five or so I've not met in the UK. Um, I've met nearly half of those in Australia and, and probably some around half of the states in, in, in the US. Um, this year I've Spend time meeting customers in Switzerland, Austria. I've been to the NERCOMP conference in Rhode Island in the US. I've also been to the Times Higher Ed Digital event in Chicago, and I've got a trip coming up to the Middle East. So lots going on. Um, that's just me, and perhaps I shouldn't be shouting about that because it's not particularly good for my carbon footprint. Um, the team here in the office are also, are also well traveled as well. Um, just go on to the next slide just to show you where I am. So today I'm joining you from um, our European head office just out, outside of Leeds in Yorkshire. Um, the Forester's Arms is our office. It's a former pub we've converted into our offices. And for those that are wondering, yes, we still do have the bar and it's great for, for company socials and bringing our customers here. Um, just some further housekeeping. Obviously, we put people on mute just because there's people too many people here to chat and, and just to say we are recording the session as well. Um, as Stephen said, feel free to ask questions as we go and we'll try and cover them off. And also I've been told to mention that as part of the promotion of this, we did say we'd be giving away some rather cool Lego. So we will make contact with the winner for that afterwards by email. Um, so about us, I think obviously we are we are very niche in what we do, application delivery and education. Nearly all higher ed, but we are starting to see um, more conversations happen with, with, with further education. During, during COVID, we saw a huge shift in dynamics and some of what we um, intend to explore, to explore today. Um, so alongside our stories and recounting some of the conversations we've had with people in person, we're gonna, we've started conducting some market research ourselves, the results of which we're going to share today are exclusively from those working in higher education. One of the most important parts of our ethos here is around partnerships, our collaboration. Since day one, we've had user groups helping bring our clients together. And in fact, I think there are a few people online today that were part of our uh, summit, our user group in Toronto last week. Um, it's through this exclusive uh, higher ed community that we believe um, this collaboration sparks innovation. 
And what we love about this sector is that despite people really being in competition, they are happy to talk and share ideas and help best practice and help deliver for the common good, which is essentially helping students succeed. So going forward, um, every quarter at least, we, we, we're going to continue to conduct these uh, trend surveys to understand uh, what is going on, what people's priorities are, um, the focus, the challenges, opportunities, and how we can collectively learn from each other to adapt, to evolve and improve. And um, we're excited today to share with you the first set of, of our results. So these are the questions that we'll be looking at. Uh, a big part of today's focus is around learning styles and locations. We saw that COVID forced a huge shift. It wasn't op optional, it was a necessity to adapt to help um, students learning. Universities were incredibly, uh, were incredible at flipping their delivery to ensure that students could keep learning. Universities are incredibly innovative and we often shout about that because we don't think enough people do. Um, institutions are often early adopters, something that I don't think people outside of higher ed actually probably appreciate. Um, Post-COVID, what we see today is actually the models probably flipped and has also changed some expectations of students. It obviously depends on, on, the, on the subject, but there could be individual activities where student can work in isolation at home. Um, therefore, why do we need to continue to come onto campus? Universities need to deliver to their customers what they want. So our first area of conversation is around where is the learning? Is it online, in person, or a mix of everything? Um, Repurposing campus, repurpose, purpose campus labs. For a long time, I've seen the trend of labs evolving. Firstly, from not necessarily needing spaces dedicated to a given subject, and it's normally engineering. Um, I think our record is we've seen lessons being scheduled for 10 p.m. at night. Then other times you have academics booking out um, rooms for students to access the computers to study. And whilst at the same time we've got open access areas, say the library, which isn't fully utilised, that's not great efficient use of that space. So we saw that the shift of, of we've seen the shift of software following the students and reutilization re of, of the lab space. Um, the second wave we now see is students do want to use their personal devices. So the question is, do we need to replace all 50 of these machines in a, in a lab refresh? Could we just replace 25 and actually um, re reuse the space a bit differently, put some more monitors or perhaps make part of the room a collaboration space, etc. The next question is then around uh, rethinking the IT menu. This is an interesting one. Um, our take is on what's, what, is, what, is, what is IT going for? What does IT need to deliver to the students to ensure success? Um, what do students want to enrich the studies and help graduation rates? Uh, sustainable higher ed, we had an office debate about this one. So what is sustainable? Originally, I took it as sort of the green IT environmental benefits, but actually, where we come from here is around sustainable projects that can continue for some, some time. It is what students want going forward. And last but not least, one of my favorite subjects, IT centralization, again, a huge topic of debate in our, in our offices. So depending on your location, you'll likely have a different view on this. Um, there are only about four or five universities in the UK which are not centralized. We've seen firsthand in various locations around the world this play out, often, getting political as people battle for power, power which I guess we appreciate is often around um, job security and or and or perhaps people's feeding their specific knowledge isn't, isn't valued. I mean so in the UK nearly everyone's decentralized in, in the US our take is the other extreme particularly large institutions multiple teams from different schools all using different technologies and having a, a different approach to doing things. So moving on to our questions and our survey results um, firstly, we asked for five trends to be ranked in priority order. So on this slide here, the smaller the number, uh, the higher the priority. And in all the results we're, we're sharing with you, um, the dark blue is the, is, the, is the highest. So in this one here, um, the priority, higher education IT priority is ranked. The number one here is, is online, in-person, hybrid, high flex, learn, which probably isn't a surprise. But I think what our results do show um, is that IT leaders need to juggle a lot of priorities and expectations. Um, but obviously the learning style or the location is the most pressing here, but you can see the results were, were, were pretty widely open. Um, for me, it's interesting to see the dynamic around the student experience. 
Um, personally, I believe that students in the UK are more demanding around what their expectations are, what they need from, from IT compared to those in, in, in North America. And why that's strange, why that's strange is the tuition fees are poles apart. So for those joining us from outside of, of the UK, um, the UK university fees are capped at under 10, still have been capped for some time under 10,000 pounds. On today's exchange rate, that's about 12,500 US dollars per year. Um, they can charge more if you're an international student, but I find that interesting that we sit here and think that a UK student is more demanding than someone paying considerably more. It, it could be that because tuition fees are, um, same new, they've been going about 20 years, but a newer thing here, so people or their parents, people's students' parents are still saying demand, have a different expectation. Um, in about, the in the UK, about 10 years ago, the main driver for projects um, that we were involved in was the student experience. Um, I'd suggest it's now going back to being more about return on investment, saving money, whereas actually what we're seeing in North America now, um, and a few meetings we've had of late, is actually now student experiences is more higher important than ever and, and back up back back up back on the agenda and our next question was what what percentage of students can study off campus um, what would have been interesting about this data was seeing what the results were prior to COVID. i suspect more around the light blue less than 25 percent um, also note, note the word study and they, that may not necessarily mean access to software but generally been able to study. So it could be watching lectures online or accessing the university's LMS. Um, but what this also suggests is that still more than half of students cannot study, cannot study off, off, off campus, which is, which is perhaps interesting. Our next question is, as part of a hybrid or high flex learning strategy, have you successfully executed any BYOD support? Again, we probably could have been more specific here around BYOD and this could be interpreted as being able to access student resources rather than specifically software. It shows the extent in which students use their own devices. And from the conversations that we see on the ground, we, we regularly see, particularly if a student's got a higher end device, it's, they've got their own device, they want to use it. Even if I'm, I'm on campus, why can't I, I use, use my own device? Our next question was, what technology do you require to fully support flexible hybrid learning? Um, this, this answer was actually free text just to get a feel for trends. Um, AI was by far the highest um, response. I'm sure we all agree that um, chat GBT isn't out the, isn't out the news currently. Um, there is still some software and access mentions, which um, from an apps anywhere perspective is, 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 is nice for us. Um, we always do uh, the EduCourse conference and our stand last year in Denver said students Hate labs. Um, perhaps our marketing team were being a little bit um, provocative, um, but it was a t it was intended to be an attention grabber. We know that students need to collaborate, have interactions, debates with their peers, but do they need to come onto campus to access software, specifically theoretical or desk-based subjects? Not not entirely sure. Um, another takeaway from our travels is it feels that U.S. institutions are trying to widen. Uh, their age cohort, I suspect probably as a, as a revenue boost. Here in the UK, we've always had quite a fair portion of, of mature or lifelong learners, we should say, especially at the, the new universities. But from a few meetings I've had in the US this year so far, um, this has been positioned as a common thing. And the discussion being that especially working parents juggling a job, juggling kids perhaps, they don't want to travel onto campus at night just to access some software. So we think that's a that's a really interesting um, theme that's that's that's, that's evolving. Um, our next question: Has your how has your institution repurposed campus labs? Now this question really interested us, particularly because only it suggests only five percent ish of those that answered have not repurposed any lab space. So it suggests that 95% of those that answered our polls um, have repurposed lab space, which is which is really interesting. Um, I think the favourite that we've heard, probably not part of a plan, because it but was a as a was a lab having to be repurposed to be a way room for the football team, as I say, through necessity rather than planning that, I suspect. Um, 
And following on to that, we then said, has there been any cost savings uh, in the changes made? Again, we expected this to be, yes, much, much higher. But um, we did note a couple of people that answered in the, in the free text to add in more information did say it's because they spent more money on refurbishing the room, making it a, a different style of teaching space. So they've only balanced out the cost so far. So going forward in the long run, they expect there to be much more savings. Um, just as a quick reminder, I will just plug again, if anyone's got any questions, please put them in the, in the, in the chat section and I'll, I will come on to those at, at the end for any questions that come out. Okay, so next slide. Um, re rethinking the IT menu. So um, really here we're saying looking at the IT services and, and realigning the service catalogue to improve the student experience. And again, it seems a bit of a, like a buzzword or, or phrase about rethinking the IT menu. And just to give Cal Poly a plug, they did a really interesting EDUCORS webinar for us, which I will provide a link to shortly, in fact. So we asked our next question, from an IT perspective, uh, what would improve your students' experience? Um, big, again, big takeaway, number one, um, dark blue, showing the bigger ones I should add as well. First of all, take away too many things going on. Um, Obviously, the two big ones in dark blue there, on-demand IT support. Um, again, my take on that is perhaps not core working hours. Um, and from the many visits we've done this year as a team, we are seeing a massive, massive issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue elsewhere, but particularly in North America is, is resources and being massively down on headcount. 50% is, is quite common with from our visits. Therefore, you need to focus on your priorities. So we would be arguing focus on the student facing activities. Um, and then the bottom point is interesting. And perhaps for those institutions that are decentralized, then this is the area where maybe there's a first step around bringing some different schools together uh, for some cost savings. We do see that software, software asset management, SAM is the next part of a lot of our um, clients journey with us. And we see that most of our customers can make some form of saving around licenses. And I know recently one institution saved about $50,000 on their SPSS license. But what we often see is it's not just about saving money. It's about actually, are we giving students what they want? Is this the right license here? Do these students want to use this off campus? Can we repurpose the money to improve the student experience, often flip, flipping around some things around for, for students? Our, our next slide was when looking for a new technology or IT solution, which the following deployment options would you prefer? And again, this probably wasn't a surprise. Um, maybe we expected a little bit less for on-prem, but, but in general, no surprise here. Um, what we've seen this year as a business is that we launched a hosted offering at the back end of last year. Every single customer that we've won this year has gone for that option. And actually, lots of um, our existing customers have, have requested to move that option. Um, I think we'd see that. Look, if it's a if it's building some servers or a databases, let let a partner do that bit and focus your team on proper value out of top of activities. Um, I will also rob a line from um, a good friend of ours, Ruben Spritz from 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 Frame Nutanix. He came to one of our, in fact, he's come to a couple of our user days recently, and he talks about being cloud smart and not cloud first. And we pinched that line, we quite like that. So there needs to be a, basically, there needs to be a compelling business argument to move something to the cloud and not just move everything. The, num the numbers need to stack up, and I, I quite, quite like that phrase. Okay, we then talk about sustainability. And, and what is sustainability? As I said, we debated in the office about is this green initiatives or is it about looking at sustainable projects that could, could continue um, for, for some time? Um, so the question we put to, to people next on this one is, are you looking to solve any of the IT, these IT challenges in, in the future? And again, you can see here quite widely spread, but dark blue, um, continuing support for online learning initiatives, again, we obviously see that on the online initiatives are big now and delivering a better IT service to students. But again, quite, quite um, close, those, those ones in comparisons. IT centralization, probably my favorite subject, actually. Uh, so as I said, there's only about four or five institutions in the UK that are still majority decentralized. 
one of them, which should remain nameless, um, we've seen they even have to have a facilitator in the room when faculty IT are talking to central IT. Um, we, we see them burning cash equally from a, don't like the word vendor, but it, it, from a vendor slash partner perspective. It's interesting in North America, the US, especially where we engage with the universities, there's some that are small enough to have central IT. And in general, those are quicker projects to get going versus, versus the likes of a, of a Michigan or a Utah, where it can take a long, long time to engage with different teams and, and bring about that change of things. Um, so with that in mind, our next question was, do you think centralizing IT is a good idea? And we were blown away with these responses here. Um, just surprisingly high on the centralizing IT was a good idea. And surprised because we see we see the battles around um, power and politics when decentralization does start. So very, very interesting that one. Um, and then digging into that a little bit further, do you plan on centralizing your IT in the future? And again, um, some, some follow-up would be interesting here, but yeah. Dark Blue again leading the way, 50% said they plan on some form of centralization in the next 12 months. So that would suggest that that's a very, very big movement. And um, this certainly has gone, 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 gone global as our responses, but um, I would suspect that's um, US responses as, as a whole there. In, in regards to talking about centralization, I mentioned Cal Poly. Um, if it's of interest, um, Perhaps I'll ask one of my colleagues just to stick that into the chat if any of the, the link for that, but it's on our website as well. Um, Alison from Cal Poly, um, at the start of the year, we did a webinar in conjunction with EduCause where they talked about their experiences and their journey, um, which people, people may find interesting. I talked earlier on about our user days, and I've been asked by colleagues to give a plug to our next user day, which is in the UK. Um, as I said, we have one last week in Toronto. Our next one is next month in Birmingham City University, which um, people are always welcome to come to, non-customers non as well. So again, that's on our website if you would like to register for that event. Um, and finally, I'm happy to take questions. I can see there's a couple of questions coming through, um, but also plugging another EduCourse webinar we're doing um, shortly in conjunction with Seneca uh, College in, in Ontario, um, where they'll be talking about their, their model of delivering to students. So again, QR code if people would, would like to sign up there. And I will just pause and have a little look in my questions to see what's there. Now I can see that's just... Um, that's about the user day. Um, okay, other questions I can see have been sent to us privately. Um, yeah, so we've, we've got, um, someone's asked about our cloud, cloud offering. Um, we have a we have a offering now called Apps Anywhere Cloud, which is basically, we, we host all the infrastructure um, as opposed to it all being on-prem. And that means that we can do a lot of the lifting for our, for our customers who are going live with us. And, that's how we position it, I think, for anything around cloud things these days. If your partner can do the lifting, let them do that and let your let your team focus on value-add activities which are student-facing and, and more specialist. So, yes, we've seen that pretty much everyone that we've been talking to, um, well, they've all taken it so far, and we expect that trend to, to, to continue. Um, yeah, another great question here. Um, we will continue to do the surveys and again, um, we'll, have, we'll gladly share these results with attendees today. Um, and that's a great point. Yeah, if there's any questions that if anyone today would like us to ask going forward that intrigue, would intrigue you, please let us know and we will happily share those on, on, on future polls that we're doing as well. Okay, so yeah, that's an interesting question. Someone's asked, how are universities in England repurposing campus labs? Is it different from the US and other areas? I would probably say not, not really. I guess the, the challenge is that often the UK universities are already centralised. So the space may be not aligned to a specific school. So it's probably easier for them to repurpose that to something else. Whereas I suspect in North America, if, if, 
if it's a school of medicine, school of science, that's their room. If that's going to be repurposed, they want it for their students and not as a general space. So maybe maybe people aren't quite as as keen on on the repurposing, but um, I think it's still the same message everywhere, and that's what we find fascinating. People often say to us, "Well, why do you work in higher ed?" And we say, "Well, look, wherever we are in the world, we don't generally change a presentation. People are still talking about SPSS, MATLAB, SolidWorks, ArcGIS. It's the same bits of software that cause people problems all around the world." Um, so I, I probably don't think there is much difference between universities in the UK and the rest of the world and the repurposing side of things. Um, uh, yeah, it's a good question as well. Someone's asked about um, apps anywhere and centralising IT. Yeah, we find this fact really interesting, and I, I, they shall remain nameless because we're at contracts. Um, in uh, um, in the North America, there's three universities that are emerging, or university merging with two colleges. And one of the challenges they have that they face is lots of different types of technologies in different institutions. And they're taking apps anywhere as the central piece, central platform to connect these different technologies across the different sites. Our view is a student doesn't care about how they're getting software, they just want to press go and it'll be delivered to them. Um, so the context here is that apps anywhere will be dropped in at the top, plugging into all different technologies from, from those campuses. Behind the scenes, if over time they want to change them, evolve to new technologies, that's absolutely fine. The student doesn't know, the student probably doesn't care, but gives you that ability to change things behind the scenes and single click access to software. Um, people are also expect me to have a crystal ball here. Do you see universities moving entire to online in the future? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I actually, one of my good friends, his son chose to go to a university that wasn't going to be 100, well, 50 to 60 percent online. He went to somewhere it was to be face to face. He was doing a subject which was less theoretical and desperate to need to be hands on. So I think some of those types of courses, maybe maybe it might depend on what the course is. If you're doing physiotherapy, dentistry, obviously you need to, you, there'll be much fashion. There's much more of a need to go on campus to use machinery or or to collaborate. But I don't. I think maybe maybe the race, maybe the the model might was going to change going forward and. But, but I, I think there's still on campus is here, is here to stay. I think that's it. After I've had a few questions thrown at me, but um, we didn't intend to go on for too long. And I'm conscious that people are very busy these days. So perhaps that just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you for those great questions. I hope you found our, our feedback and our surveys of interest. Feel free to, to message myself and the team with any, any feedback or comments or questions for next time. Uh, and again, thank you for, for taking the time to listen to us today. And we hope to see you all in person very soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.